In 2021, Kyle Rittenhouse stood trial for fatally shooting two men and wounding another with a semi-automatic rifle during an August 2020 protest over police violence in Kenosha, Wisconsin. The victim's families hoped for justice, and Rittenhouse was charged with multiple crimes. In the end, he was fully acquitted. While some on the left, like California Governor Gavin Newsom, worried about the message the verdict might send to armed vigilantes, some on the right praised Rittenhouse as a hero. Donald Trump congratulated him and then invited him to Mar-a-Lago. But the families of the victims were not done. John Huber, the father of Anthony Huber, who tried to disarm Rittenhouse before Rittenhouse shot Huber dead, he filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Rittenhouse and local law enforcement. Huber's family alleges that police officers deputized Rittenhouse and conspired with him to harm protesters. They say those actions violated Huber's civil rights and caused his death. The law enforcement officers filed a motion to dismiss the lawsuit based in part on a legal doctrine which protects police officers from personal liability in civil claims, just like this one. That legal doctrine is called qualified immunity. And yesterday, a judge ruled against that motion. The case can proceed, at least for now. The judge says the question of qualified immunity is still a live matter, which the judge will decide at a later date. Hoover's parents said in a statement, make no mistake, our fight to hold those responsible for Anthony's death accountable continues in full force. Anthony will have his day in court. A day in court a way around qualified immunity, which has protected so many officers who have shot and killed unarmed civilians like Tyree Nichols and too many others. That, that day in court, is what members of the Congressional Black Caucus discussed with President Biden and Vice President Biden at the White House this afternoon. They want the president's help in passing the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act. That bill passed the House in 2021, but it fell apart in the Senate. And the sticking point was qualified immunity. Will the, ba will the bill have a different fate with this Congress? President Biden put it this way today. My hope is this dark memory for some action that we've all been fighting for. Joining us now is Philip Ativa Goff, co-founder and CEO of the Center for Policing Equity and chair of the African-American Studies and, Prof uh, and professor of psychology at Yale University. I feel like we're missing a word in that introduction. <laughs> Philip, thank you for being here tonight. Um, this is, you know, rarely do I feel the need to get very specific about parts of the law <laughs> in, such, in such detail, but qualified immunity is the thing here, right? This is holding police officers, account, officers accountable in civil cases, because for people who do not know, when we're talking about criminal charges for police officers, the police are criminally charged in less than 2% of fatal shootings and convicted in less than a third of those cases. So it's vanishingly rare to have police held accountable for fatal shootings in criminal charges. Civil cases are a different matter. Can you explain how we came to live in a world where qualified immunity is the thing police can count on um, as a shield, effectively, in cases where there appears to be gross negligence? Sure, and I'll try and do it without getting extra, extra nerdy for you and the <laughs> audience. Um, but I, I got to say, I'm a professional nerd, so bear with me. We want um, you to be as nerdy happens, as you need to be. Essentially, what happens in 1982, there's a Supreme Court case. Um, <clears throat> people are concerned that um, not just law enforcement, but um, <clears throat> the staff of elected officials won't be able to go about doing their jobs if they're worried that every little thing they do could be litigated um, uh, and could become sort of a political football, kind of like what we saw in Congress today. <laughs> um, so the Supreme Court expands, um, in Harlow versus Fitz Fitzgerald, expands the sort of blueprint for what qualified immunity can do, and essentially says, if there wasn't an explicit example of this very thing being illegal before, then you can't be uh, held accountable for it going forward. Um, and the cases where it comes up, like exactly uh, the case that you uh, uh, led with uh, on Kyle Rittenhouse, are so disgusting. Someone has done something so obviously unreasonable and egregious, and yet there wasn't a case just like that before, and so we're not able to hold law enforcement accountable somehow. We throw our hands up um, because of the doctrine of qualified immunity that people get really outraged about it. 
Um, so that's why there are folks who say we got to get rid of it. Um, I can't quite tell you what the argument is about why we've, we've got to keep it. I can say that the argument that gets advanced is, well, no law enforcement will want to do their job, but no surveys of law enforcement, no serious social science of law enforcement supports that as a reasonable conclusion. Um, but that, that's essentially what it is, and that's part of what um, the argument has been about uh, with regards to the justice and policing and, and QI. And basically, I mean, qualified immunity, the advent of quality, qualified immunity, I mean, though, though there are cases that strengthen it in the 80s, it starts in the civil rights era, hmm, which is when people first start saying what the police are doing to civilians is not right. And it's the first time there's justice for people. And then quickly, I think between 1961 and 1967, qualified immunity crops up to basically protect the people who are doing wrongs against the weakest members of society or the most marginalized, if you will. I mean, that's not a coincidence, that's right. is it? That's right. So essentially, it gets it gets codified in 1967, expanded into the current form in 1982, um, and those are periods of time when you have particularly regressive forces interested in making sure that there's a carve out so that law enforcement doing dirty work that really appears bad. Um, and by the way, they didn't have uh, you know home video cameras in 1967, but the shock to the conscience of the nation was photographs in newspapers. There was new media that was showing pictures of things. You guys remember them maybe from that one class that folks uh, took during Black History Month where the fire hoses um, yes. are being turned uh, against uh, uh, school children, the police dogs are being turned. Those same kinds of things where all of a sudden we're seeing as if for the first time, wow, they're really doing terrible things to black folks. That's the first time we, we uh, see it, the second time we see it in 1982, and now there is great outrage about it. But as we're moving to think about what Congress can do, I think it's important that Though it has those terrible, disgusting roots, and it is it is absolutely ideologically on, princ on principle a thing we got to get rid of, it, it is not going to solve all of these problems. It has been named as the sticking point for the Justice and Policing Act. I don't know that that's real rather than politics. And of the cases that qualify for qualified immunity, the best research we have is only about 30 percent of the cases actually end up invoking it even a little bit. And it's not even clear how many of those cases hinge or turn on qualified immunity. So I don't want us to think that even if we get it through, that that's solving like you know, a huge swath of this accountability issue. It is an important piece. It's a principled piece because it's so disgusting to us to look at, but it is not the largest lever that we could get done. So I don't I want to adjust people's expectations, even if it makes it through Congress, that being a vanishingly thin margin, even on its own. Well, we know that there's action at the state level around qualified immunity, but there's another part of the civil cases that I think bears highlighting. <laughs> if, in fact, law enforcement is found guilty in a civil case, who pays, who pays the civil payout? This is shocking to me. I did not know this. The government, the local government, not the police department, local government, and in some cases, taxpayers are the people that pay out. Like, there is a, a world in which Tyree Nichols' family sues in a civil case, and the people of Memphis have to foot the bill for a police department that beat to death Tyree Nichols. Is that right? So let's make it even more specific. Um, Tyree Nichols is killed in Memphis, and Tyree Nichols' family pays for the misconduct, right? Because if they are taxpayers in that city, that's exactly how it works. Um, there are so many protections against officers being held individually um, accountable. By the way, individual officers are not walking around with millions of dollars to do these kinds of settlements. So when we have Rampart of $125 million or in Baltimore, the $13 million just for the gun uh, trace task force, the uh, individual officers couldn't do um, that kind of compensation. But yes, it comes back to the city. Um, and God forbid the city is fi finds a way to move around that, the union would then protect and indemnifies individual officers. Right, So it is not the case that the officers pay a price outside of the criminal context. Um, the city is paying a price, and at the very least, the union is pay paying that price in insurance claims that it's set up to make sure don't actually affect the budget in any way. Uh, it, is, it is just the, the level of insanity and sh like wrongness in all of this. Philip Atibagoff, um, you did not nerd out. It was br a brilliant explanation. Thank you for your insight and wisdom as, off as always. Co-founder and CEO of the Center for Policing Equity. It's always good to see you. Good to see you.